this is about habit and learning, and it's by Arthur Kessler, who's most famous for his work, Darkness at Noon. And um, it, it's from his classic work, The Ghosts in the Machine. And it really, you know, in, in a kind of you know, mass communication, technological sense, I mean, the idea about habit and learning is you just get good at what you do right? Ha habits freeze you. They kind of reify and solidify your, your skills. And, um, you know, whether that's, you know, on p p playing Grand Theft Auto or Clash of Clans, or whether that's flying an airplane or that's playing the piano, right? We like, like, like habits in a way, uh, circumscribe possibilities and, and, and indeed have a, a very limiting effect. What happens when a skill is practiced in the same unvarying conditions? Kessler says, if a skill is practiced in the same unvarying conditions following the same unvarying course, it tends to degenerate into stereotyped routine and its degrees of freedom frees up. Monotony accelerates, enslavements to habit. It makes the rigor mortis of mechanization spread upward in the hierarchy. And, and so, I mean, that's the kind of, uh, uh, the, like the dual edged, Janus faced aspect of habit, right? I mean, what we do, we get good at, but it prevents us from getting good at other stuff. It becomes a kind of unvarying, degenerated, stereotyped routine. What does he mean by a crisis? However, the challenge of the environment can exceed a critical limit where it can no longer be met by skilled routine, however flexible, because the customary rules of the game are no longer adequate to cope with the situation. Then a crisis arises. It's very interesting to kind of talk about this pandemic as a sort of crisis because our skilled routine you know, even though it's pretty flexible, right? I mean, to, we have these amazing medical facilities and a lot of technology and highly skilled doctors. However, uh, we were not so flexible that, um, what, you know, we, 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 we could avoid this crisis of having many people die. Right, it, because we hadn't anticipated it before. I mean, I think in the future we'll be much better with these things. But certainly, a crisis is when uh, the challenge of the environment can exceed a critical limit, where it can no longer be met by the ordinary, habitual, skilled routine of the organism. What is the principal cause of stagnation and extinction? Uh, you know, and, and th so this is, you know, this would be like in species as well as you could say corporations, as, as well as you could talk about, I don't know, maybe aspects of our lives in a way, you know, the principle called like, like when we stagnate, when we sort of fossilize into habit, I mean, you, you, you could say like, you know, habits of diet where we don't change a routine, even though it leads up to a crisis of having a heart attack or something, right? Um, you know, everybody who's an alcoholic, it wasn't a problem in the beginning. It's only later on that, uh, you know, th things go wrong. So the principal cause of stagnation and extinction is over-specialization. Over-specialization, doing the same thing too much over and over and over again. That's what over-specialization is, being too skilled at one thing where other things are, are left ignored. What are the two outcomes with respect to a major crisis? Uh, this is what Kessler says. <coughs> he says, however, the challenge may exceed a critical limit so that it can no longer be met by the organism's customary skills. In such a major crisis, and both biological evolution and human history are punctuated by such crises, one of the two possibilities may occur. The first is degenerative, right? That's the first, leading to stagnation, biological senescence, 
or decay, right? That's what senescence is, or sudden extinction, as the case may be. The alternative possibility of reacting to a critical challenge is regenerative in a broad sense. It involves major reorganizations of structure and behavior which result in biological or mental progress. So those are the two outcomes with respect to a major crisis. And let me give you an example, right? So degenerative on the one hand, regenerative on the other. So a guy is in his 50s and uh, say so like 52, like, and he gets laid off. Boom, that's a major crisis. Well, I mean, there are two possibilities, degenerative or regenerative. So degenerative would be you know, he just loses it. He doesn't know what to do. He goes bankrupt. He loses his house. He gets divorced. He becomes an alcoholic. Everything goes bad, right? Everything decays. Well, that's one possibility. Another possibility that you, you know, you could write for this tale would be regenerative. And what if this guy, after, you know, up a month of trying to figure out what to do with his sick leave, is like, okay, I'm 52. I just got laid off. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And then he rises in, in a regenerative fashion meets the occasion head on and says, I've always wanted to be this or that, you know, I've always wanted to be a nurse. And then he spends two years and he goes back to school and gets his nursing degree. And, uh, you know, he works for the next, I don't know, say 15 or 16 years. He makes a lot of money. And he retires when he's 68 or even 70 because he likes it so much. And right? He lives happily ever after and none of that bad stuff happens. Or say he wants to be a teacher or maybe he wants to be an artist or something. You know, he wants to open a bed and breakfast. It doesn't really matter, right? A crisis could be an opportunity as well as a kind of degenerative decay. So the two outcomes with respect to a major crisis are degenerative, right, when things go bad, and regenerative, which kind of lends to a recreation of the organism. What does he mean by unlearning? Well, Arthur Kessler says to unlearn is more difficult than to learn. That's interesting, right? To unlearn is more difficult than to learn. And it seems that the task of breaking up rigid cognitive structures and reassembling them into a new synthesis cannot, as a rule, be performed in the full daylight of the conscious rational mind. It can only be done by reverting to those more fluid, less committed, and specialized forms of thinking, which normally operate in the twilight zones of awareness. And I think, you know, uh, that, that, and it, so what he's talking about is kind of like subconscious states and such, you know, um, and that would be like in dreams that kind of stuff, as well as, I mean, like certain hallucinogenic drugs, maybe like LSD or mushrooms or something, you know, it's, uh, it's it, it, like this, this idea of unlearning is very interesting.